You are listening to Love Your Practice with Dr. Laura Mock. I'm a general dentist, a practice owner, and a certified life coach. I teach women who own dental practices to lead with intention and literally fall in love with their businesses. Keep listening and you will see how learning to love your practice turns into loving your life too. Hello there and welcome to another episode of my podcast, Love Your Practice. I'm Dr. Laura Mock and I'm here to introduce you to my next guest. Um, who I interviewed last night. She's so fascinating, so compassionate, so knowledgeable. Her name is Robin Ramirez, and she is a dental consultant who is now certified in the art of having important conversations. And I invited her on to my podcast because I heard her speak and I thought this information is vital to my people who listen to this podcast. Remember, every time I have somebody on, it's because I think they can enrich your life. And this conversation is no different. And in fact, it's a conversation about conversations and how important it is for us to understand how we work as humans when we talk to people. And guys, I just think this is a really important topic because we think of ourselves as technicians, but we are also business owners. And that means we are also managers. So give this episode a listen. I'll see you on the other side. And thanks for tuning in. Okay, I would like to welcome to this episode of our podcast, Robin Ramirez. Thank you so much for coming on, Robin. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Laura. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited. I was so thrilled to meet you at my first ever in-person, not ever, first since the pandemic started, in-person meeting at, which was Jumpstart in January in Arizona. And your speech that you gave knocked me off my feet. I was so impressed. I immediately got on my laptop and asked you to be a guest on my podcast. Well, thank you. Yes, um, I remember you you asked me right away and I was super excited about that because anything I can do to to help people and to spread the word, this stuff is so important and it's fun and it's fun. So yeah. Yeah. Now let's go back to what this stuff is because I'm going to let you describe it since it's your mission. Um, And I don't know if I could do as good of a job explaining what you do as you do. So let's pretend we're in the elevator and I'm like, hi, I'm Laura. And you're like, hi, I'm Robin. And I say, well, what do you do, Robin? Like describe to you how, you know, tell me what you do. All right. Fair enough. So what I was speaking about at the event that, that we were at is conversational intelligence. Um, so in a nutshell, every time we have a conversation, we interact with somebody, we release chemicals, hormones, um, neurons fire in our brain and um, we either release feel good uh, hormones or um, you know protective hormones and it changes the dynamic of how everybody within that conversation is going to act and react and so it literally can change our perspective and it and not even necessarily just within that conversation but it can carry over into our next conversations it can even go on to affect our whole day so essentially it's helping people to understand that chemistry and how to affect that chemistry to have more effective conversations, Mm -hmm. conversations with other people and those conversations that happen within our own heads, (laughs) between our own two ears, because it affects us as well. Well, very much our self-talk definitely affects our day and our lives. 100%. So would you call yourself a conversation coach? Yes. Uh, yes, conversation communication coach. Mm-hmm. And you uh, specialize in the dental office, right? You've been in the dental industry for a long time. I have. I've been in the dentistry or in the dental industry for probably a combined um, length of uh, close to 20 years. In dentistry. Wow. And I've just recently broken out on my own um, to do to do this work specifically. I was a business development coach and I found that it was the interaction dynamics and the conversations and, um, you know, just helping coach that piece of it. How can we all get along (laughs) more or less, right? I mean, there's definitely more to it than that, but that was absolutely my passion. And so, um, 
And so I've kind of started my own thing doing just specifically that. Well, I certainly know what it feels like to step out and try something new and like, you know, you hang your little shingle out and you're like, okay, I'm here to help. Who needs help? <laughs> and then, Anyone? Anybody need help? I can help you. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. So before, when you said you were a business development coach, were you helping people who wanted to grow their dental practices or describe what it, that was? Exactly. Exactly. So um, most people um, came into that relationship with, ex with exactly that as their agenda. I want to grow my practice, my practice. And, um, you know, it, it didn't take long with, with any client typically to find out, I mean, it was definitely more than just that you've got to get, as you well know, and I've heard on so many of your episodes, you know, it's, it, why, to what end, like we can make you as much money as you want. We can get you as big as you want. We can do all of those things, but what is that going to look like when you get there? Are you going to be more happy? Are you going to have better relationships? Are you going to feel better and, you know, be less stressed? Um, and so, yes, I help them grow their practices. And, um, and then that's where I really found that my heart was even more so like both. And I don't want to just help you grow your practice and not be happier with your practice and going into your practice and, and going home afterwards and enjoying your family. Yeah. And maybe, I don't know, have a hobby that you actually have time for and you don't feel guilty pursuing because you're not, you know, at your business. Those well, sorts yeah. Of Let me just pause you right there because I just think that you touched on something super important for all of my listeners to understand. And that is that you can race the numbers. You can go for the next big thing. Oh, now I have 50 patients a month. 50 new patients, or now we're producing $150,000 a month or, or whatever it is. But unless you get what's happening in your head and your relationships, right? Those numbers have zero meaning. You'll hit them and you'll feel just as empty as you did before. Absolutely. And it sounds like you were seeing that. And as you saw it, you visualized a path where you could help people in a slightly different way. So you're still in dentistry and you're still helping owners of dental practices, but now it looks more like what, how does, how do you typically help somebody now? So what I love about it is it's both and. So as I, I don't anymore, I don't help specifically as a quote business development coach. So I'm not looking at P&Ls, I'm not helping, you know, kind of that consultant piece of it, not helping decide, should I buy this new piece of equipment? How am I going to get an ROI on that? You know, do I, should I hire more people, less people, you know, those specific sort of things. Um, and yet I'm, so my piece of it is more around um, how can you still do all of that and maybe even with your own separate business development coach that is helping you with those things or you've got your own you know team in those areas and um and uh so perform even better feel even better have amazing relationships with your patients with your team you know um oh, and, and be understood and be able to understand laura this is one thing that really struck me, I, I learned years ago about a study out of Stanford University, and they found that nine out of 10 conversations missed the mark, meaning that the intent doesn't equal the impact. 90% of the time, what we're laying down, the other person isn't picking up, at least in not, not exactly in the way we intended it. And we don't always know that. Like sometimes it might just be a nuance and we think we've been understood, but we haven't been. And so this is kind of the long story to say, you know, everything happens through conversation. Everything we do has to come through communication and conversation. And if 90% of the time that's not hitting home in the way we intended, well, that's a huge opportunity. And I saw it over and over and over again. People would come to me wanting, quote, business development. I want to grow my business. And it always there was a huge circle back to there's, we're missing some things in communication. We need better systems. Well, we put them in place seven different times and yet they're still not getting done. What is happening <laughs> or why is it not happening is maybe the better question. And, you know, it just, they, well, our, our patients are upset and confused about the fees, but we told them 
well, okay, wait, wait, but how come they're still upset and confused? How did they miss that conversation? Well, they knew what they were coming in for today. We told them, well, they obviously didn't understand. But, you know, and, and so all of those different conversations, I told my team that this is what I wanted. Why is it not happening? Oh, I hear that one a lot. <laughs> right? From my, from my clients. Yeah. Even more so than just, the patients is they're like, why don't my employees do what I'm asking them to do? All the time, right? And so I, what I just found is all of these issues just kept coming back to the communications. And that's when I decided, okay, you know what? That's that's my dealio. That's my passion is helping people to close that gap. Well, today I would like for you to tell us some tips on having more effective communication, especially within the dental team. But what I want to do first is I just want everyone who's listening to know that it's normal and natural for this to be a pain point in your practice. For sure. And Robin, I thought it might be fun for you and I to just extemporaneously brainstorm on reasons why this is challenging in the dental practice. So why don't you throw an idea out and I'll actually I'll start since so I'm not putting you on the spot. I think that the traditional dental practice model does not allow for any time or space for effective communication at all. If my burr's not turning, I'm not earning. That's what I was taught. Right? Oh, all, I, I hear that all of the time. Coaching dental offices, it, Laura, I, you nailed a huge one. Are you guys doing morning huddles? We don't have time for that. Okay, do you do growth conferences? I, I have no time for growth conferences. I just let them know if they're doing something wrong like in the moment or, or when it, I, I get so upset by it that, you know, I pull them into my office and break down or whatever, you know, the case may be, we don't have time yeah. is, is over and over. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and maybe where I, when I hear someone say, I don't have time for that. What I hear is, I don't believe that's important. Bingo. Bingo. And it's okay um, if you don't believe um, that's important, but then you have to have the expectation that you're going to get the result of mediocre communication. Right. And um, yes, I, I agree with all of that 100%. And um, I think part of it is once once you can start sort of opening your mind to, I, I think that people um, start to feel overwhelmed by it. Like there's just too many places that we're missing the mark. I don't even know where to start. It, it's going to take a half day meeting with the whole team, you know, to try to talk all this out and work all of this out. Um, so I, I think it's so helpful if people just take a step back and, and think, where are the little places that I can reinforce that, that isn't going to take all day or even 10 minutes? It's just in the moment, you know, the, the small pieces of communication, sometimes we, we forget the opportunities that we do have because we feel like we have to tackle it all at once. So read, reason number two would be because we think we have to fix it all. If we're going to try, we have to fix it all. And that's too hard. I'm overwhelmed. I can't. So I'm not going to try. Yep. I love how you summed that up. I think that's, that's so true. If, if I can't get to the goal, then, you know, today, then let's not get started. You know, never mind that it took me one or 10 or 20 years, you know, to get, to get here. It might take, you know, one or two months or maybe, you know, one or two years to slowly you know, to turn the tide and get things back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw out a third one. And then if you have a fourth one, let me know. This mm -hmm. is for women. I have no idea what the man's experience is, but as a woman, I was taught from the time I was probably, I don't know, 18 months old, that it was my job to look good. But people would think I'm cute and make people around me happy. Okay. So at take that little person who was socially cultured to make others happy and have her buy a business where she doesn't even really see herself as a manager, but more of a technician. And then mm -hmm. that expectation of, well, I'm just supposed to make everybody happy. So I'm going to make the patients happy and I'm going to make the employees happy. And if I don't like something, well, I'm just going to take a deep breath and it's going to be fine. And I'm just going to keep on doing that for five to seven years until I completely lose my shit. Because I've never asked for what I want. Right. Yes. And I'm afraid to ask for what I want because then I'm not following the role that I think I'm supposed to do. Right. Because, well, then I'm just going to upset, like we're, we're getting along 
and you know status quo is working although it's not mm -hmm. right <laughs> and yet we're uh, we're afraid to upset what is uh, because we're yeah um it, it, but yes, I think that people are um, afraid of what what might come around and, and afraid to upset, you know, gosh, it's going to be a difficult conversation. If I just, if I ignore it, it will go away. Yes. <laughs> it will it's resolve itself or I will retire eventually and it won't be a problem anymore. <laughs> Yeah. Right. Yeah. I hope I don't have to make anybody feel bad with this desire that I have, you know, because I'm not supposed to do that. Right. Yes. And so we end up not exactly as you said, we don't state actually what we need, what our request is. Instead, maybe we, um, well, you maybe know, you could kind of sort around. of, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> right. And then, and then we're get more and more frustrated that they're not picking again, picking up what we're laying down. And right, because we're not being clear if we talk like that. And so the employees are like, is this something I'm supposed to do? Right. Is this no. optional? Because I feel like it's optional. I or they like honestly, who's doing they honestly don't me. even understand the request or that it was a request. Right. So so often um, people will throw something out thinking, well, you know what, Laura, I hear it my family all the time, <laughs> right? Like my husband will throw something out and he he thinks that he has asked for something specific. And then he's frustrated with one child or the other that they're not jumping right up to do that. Uh -huh. And, you know, over years, we've kind of figured out how to communicate that a little more uh, pointedly. But I see it, you know, I mean, I, we see it all of the time that people think that they've communicated the number one conversational blind spot. So this is going to be mine that I'm going to throw out. Okay. Is assuming that everybody thinks like me. That's oh. the number one conversational blind spot. Yeah. Um, I assume that others see what I see, they feel what I feel, they think what what I think, um, and so we're we're literally unable to realize how differently other people see the world. Especially if people kind of get into that um, mode of they, they're just attached to their point of view. They're they're so engrossed in what they know and what they think, they they literally just assume that ever you know why why wouldn't people come. I'm going to, I'm putting it in quotes, common sense, yes. right? Common sense is so rare. It should be called a superpower as they say, but people say, well, that's just common sense. Well, maybe it's your common sense from your experience, but maybe somebody else has another experience and another point of view and, you know, and so forth. And that it actually leads, did you also realize this is something else I learned that um, I was surprised to hear. I was surprised to hear it said like this, but after I started thinking about it, and now that I've started observing it, it doesn't surprise me at all. But human beings actually have a very high addiction to being right. Oh, yes. So literally, they get addicted to being well, right. It feels so much more comfortable if you're right than if well, you're not. Well, oh, for sure, for sure. And, and it, it releases dopamine in our brain, right? Which is that it gives us sort of that natural high. It's our brain's reward center. And people literally get addicted to that dopamine like we all know that one we all like to be right for sure mm -hmm. we all know that one person and hopefully it's not us although I, you know i'm going to raise my hand i've absolutely caught myself in conversations where i won't let it go like i'm going to be right damn it and it, it, even on something that doesn't even matter but i just keep pushing it much less now that i understand that literally there's an addiction to being right um but being able to to drop that and for some people it's it they kind of have to wean away from that like or, or do a cold break they don't even understand that um that it's a problem they can't see it they're blind to it well and so. if i were going to apply that to like me or some other female dental practice owner what i would say is and what i hear from my clients is why doesn't the team see what I'm seeing? A lot of times I hear them say, there's a hole in the schedule and nobody will fill it unless I go up there and I say, look, there's this hole here. Have you called Mrs. Jones? And they, they get upset because the team isn't seeing things exactly the way that they're seeing things, not realizing that it's actually a benefit to them for the team to see things from a different perspective. So I think we've really covered some reasons why it would be normal for any of my listeners to feel like this is a hard place to be. Having those conversations, getting them started is a challenge.
And that's why I wanted to have you on here because you explained challenging conversations in such a beautiful way in your speech. So let's pretend you're back up on the stage and you're explaining that spectrum that you told me about with the cortisol and was it oxytocin? I can't remember. And yeah. the front of the brain and the back of the brain and give me like a five to seven minute summary of hard conversations. So in really, Laura, hard conversations for sure, but just any conversation. When we walk into that, when we walk into any conversation, um, it, our chemistry, whatever that is, we are bringing that into the comments, into the conversation, and um, and it is catchy. There's what's called mirror neurons. People are mirroring how we feel, and literally also our hormones are catchy. People are are will start to feel exactly what our energy is, which is a surprise to nobody, right? Like when somebody walks into work in the morning and they're in a mood. Everybody can be kind of jolly and happy and, you know, rubbing elbows. And then that person walks in the room. They don't have to say word one and you can feel it. You, you can, can feel, feel the chemistry yes. change. And that's not in your head. That's a physical change in your body. And it will physically change your brain and, and what part of your brain you're using. So when, when we feel threatened and that's any kind of a, a threat, that could be a threat. It doesn't just have to be physical, right? It could be a threat to our comfort zone or a threat to our status or our territory. Or even if we um, are worried about being judged or ostracized or um, ridiculed, any any of those things, if we're, if we're worried, if, if the atmosphere we're in for any reason um, feels uncomfortable, then our bodies start releasing cortisol. And that literally puts us, it, the, the cortisol is a stress hormone and it, it puts us into that fight, flight, freeze, or appease state of mind to one degree or, or another, depending on how, how threatened we feel or our bodies feel. And it puts us sort of into that protect mode, which literally, and this is the part that people don't necessarily understand, that protect mode is in the, the back, you know, lower part of our brain and, and a little bit on the left side can be, but for the sake of this conversation, we're going to say, so the back and left side of the brain where um, that, that's sort of our survival brain. And that's where we go when we feel any sort of a threat. On the other side of our brain, and especially the prefrontal cortex and the right side of our brain is more our sage brain or our executive brain, some people call it. That's where all of our higher functions take place. That's, that's where our creativity comes from, our problem solving skills, our empathy, our compassion, um, all of our you know, ability to, our insight, our foresight, all of those higher thinking capabilities come from the prefrontal cortex. When we are, when our bodies feel threatened, the neural pathways literally shut down to the prefrontal cortex, so, right? It, it shuts down our ability to get to those higher skills. So we lose our ability to reason. We um, lose our problem solving skills to one degree or another. So it might not be a hundred percent, Here's, a, here's the biggest one. This one, like my jaw hit the floor when I found this out, but it really doesn't surprise me when you start thinking about it. But we liter it literally changes the way that we see and interpret reality. Mm. So if we're upset when we're in a conversation or if we're fearful or we're worried about being judged, any of those things, our actual perception of reality is altered away from what is real. And our bodies are... are, are brain is shutting down our access to those higher functions is so that we can survive over thrive. Those are our thriving functions. And our brain is like, well, no, 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 we're going to put our energy into surviving right now. Mm -hmm. And so we lose our ability to access those higher functions. And, um, and we literally see the world differently. And, um, and our, like we've already, we've all been with somebody who's been triggered, right. That we can't seem to reason with. Like they're just not getting, they're being completely incorrigible, unreasonable. And we're like freaking focused. Or do you even know what you're talking about right now? And the truth is no, they really, they really can't access that. So I can see two ways that this might happen in my dental office. And one is if I'm feeling threatened, yeah. like if my team comes to me and they're like, we want more vacation or not that because I give my team an excess of vacation, but something 
Yeah. Or if I'm saying to an assistant or a hygienist or whatever, I want you to do this differently. Mm-hmm. If I'm doing that from the wrong place, if I'm giving them anger feelings, you know, if I'm mirroring, uh, causing them to mirror anger or defensiveness, then they're not even going to really be able to hear what I'm saying. Bingo. Bingo. That's, um, that's another huge blind spot for people is assuming that the meaning of what you're saying resides in what you're saying in the speaker. When really, when we're talking, the meaning of what we're saying resides in the listener. So whatever state of mind they're in, Mm -hmm. that's how they're going to be able to receive. And so more often, really what people remember about a conversation we're in is the own sort of diatribe that was going on in their head, what they were thinking about the that conversation rather than what you were actually saying. So yes, if, if that person is defensive and, or if they're picking up on your, like maybe you're worried about, you know, as the doctor going into this conversation, cause you, you feel like you're going to get resistance or they're going to be upset about this correction you need to make in their behavior or this news that you have to give them. So you're feeling anxious. They pick up on that anxiousness. Um, yeah, it's just that that snowball effect. Okay, so you have done a really nice job of like setting me up for doing this not right, or like you've shown me the danger, <laughs> Don't do that. right? <laughs> this is how we usually do it, Laura. <laughs> but what I want to hear from you in the second half of this podcast is some tips for me and my ladies who are listening. How can we avoid these pitfalls? How can we keep the conversation? in the prefrontal cortex. Perfect. So um, the the biggest thing that you can do, right? And and it can be hard because if if you're triggered, you're triggered. So I've been, you know, I've I've listened to you, um, you know, and and I know that you, um, for yourself, and you've had a lot of people on your podcast, and I know that you're really into sort of that mental fitness, like that positivity and getting yourself in a good mental state. And that's integral to all of this. So yes, I'm a communication and conversation coach and just as much like what, you know, you're learning around this and, and what I think we also innately know is that you've got, you've got to be able to be in that calm centered place. You don't have to be, but the more that you are, the better these conversations are going to go. You're going to be able to see the whole perspective with blameless discernment, more of an observation mode, as opposed to an emotional, like in the moment, you can kind of take a step back from it. So one tool um, for that is, um, I don't know if you'll remember from from my talk, but I put up on on the screen what's called the conversational dashboard, Mm -hmm. right? Which I think is a a beautiful tool and um, that you can kind of picture it. You don't have to have the, you know, the the actual um, dashboard to be able to understand that if you're, you know, if you picture a car dashboard, if you're on empty or, you know, at zero miles per hour, that's when you, you're you really triggered, high cortisol, right? And so you can know that not only you, but also your listener is going to be, if they're over there and, or if they're listening to you, they're, they're going to be resisting. They're going to be skeptical. They're going to be all of those sorts of things. In the middle is more to, and that also comes with really low trust. Sure. So, so trust is a big one. So I would say the first thing you can do is prime the conversation for trust. Any conversation you're going into, ask yourself, what can I do to sort of set the stage for, um, for trust so that this person can come in and kind of put their guard down, which also means that you have to come from a place of trust and empathy that you trust that the person on the other side of that conversation um, does sort of deserves um, whatever it is you're going to say with uh, and can and can take it with an open heart. So how can I present this in a in a loving, caring way? Do I care about the person on the other side of this conversation? And if you do, then how can I bring this to them in such a way? that they understand it's coming from a loving, caring side and not from a distressed beside myself um, place, if that makes sense. 
So what does the other side points. of the dashboard look like? We've got missed yeah, so, yep. all and unhappiness here. And then what's on the other side? So the other side is that love is the oxytocin side, which is the love hormone. <laughs> so, and that's high, high trust, right? And that's where those uh, transformational conversations happen. That's where there's co-creation and experimentation. Um, and in the middle is sort of that conditional trust, the sort of wait and see, ah, I'm not sure how I feel about this. You know, I'm sort of on the line. I might buy into it. Let me see what she's going to say next. You know, that's kind of when you're sitting on the edge of the seat and maybe they are with, they, they're not totally trusting this space yet. So, um, so a couple tricks, if you will, for the, to get way over on that right side of the dashboard, or at least, you know, any click, you can move to the right. You can get further up the speedometer or start to fill the gas tank. Any click is helpful. So again, you know, just like with um, with the practice, you know, we can't go from zero to a hundred maybe, but even if we can get to one step at a time and continue to build that trust with each new conversation where everybody can start to let down their guard a little more, a little guard, we can't, a little more, a little more can't necessarily undo it all. If there's any sort of distrust or problems there, it's not necessarily just going to be in one conversation. We yeah. might have to have, you know, little small wins, not saying that you win a conversation, but you win a little bit more trust, a little more trust. So a, a couple tips for this, Laura, if I can. Mm -hmm. um, one that I think is really big um, that I think um, th that I see dentists miss out on a lot. And um, so I think that your, your clients, your listeners, using the word experiment. So we've talked about putting in systems and that sort of thing. Um, and so whether it's with the whole team or you just need to talk to one person, like say about corrective behavior or whatever it is, if it's possible in that conversation to talk about experimenting with this, instead of saying, you know what we're gonna try? We're gonna try X, Y, and Z. Typically, people are going to put their heels in on that because it feels like it's forever and they're going to come up with all the reasons it won't work. Yeah, but this and what about that? And did you think through this? But if you can use the word, you know what, we're going to experiment with X, Y, and Z. Now people can, I mean, can you kind of feel your body just relax a little bit more yeah, with the word? It's kind of like deflating or diffusing of like, yeah. oh no, she's changing things. Oh, but it's an experiment, which means I still have a say in this and we're we're looking to see what's happening before we decide for sure right right 100 percent. and to your point earlier that it's to your advantage it's to the owner's advantage to recognize that that people are seeing things that you're not seeing so if you can put things into place as an experiment it's good for you too then to be able to come back and let let the team know or let the person know you know what we I'm not just saying it's an experiment. Let's try it for X amount of time. Let's try it for a month. And then let's put a date on our calendar right now. So again, we're building trust. They're seeing you literally make the next appointment. Following up already. So, yep. To come back around and say, okay, how is this working? And here's another one for you then. Always start with what's going well. Yes. So when they come back in that conversation, what it, in any conversation, so here's another one for whether it's team meetings or growth conversations or coming back to this conversation. When so often when we get into a conversation, especially women, and I don't know why, but we, because I think we, we just right away sort of use each other as confidants, which I think is a, a fabulous thing. And yet we, we tend to jump right in to if I made the bitch session, <laughs> you know, and I think we just feel like, Hey, we're venting with each other, yes. which we all need a place Here's to the person vent. who understands me. Let me tell you everything that went wrong. It, right. A hundred percent. Right. And so we need a place to vent. And yet, um, neuro, neuro, neurologically, <laughs> if we start with what's going well, it forces our brain to that pre it activates our prefrontal cortex, okay. which is where all of our higher thinking takes place. That's where our solutions and problem solving skills, our creativity, that's where we, we solve things. That's where we come up with our, our passion, our creativity, our curiosity. So we can solve things from the other side, not as effectively, not as quickly, not as creatively. And it will be through blame, shame, guilt, anxiety, hurt. That's that's what, how we tend to, to solve things from our survival brain. If we can instead get to that prefrontal cortex, now we're seeing 
things that we didn't see before. Collaboration, so that's where we creativity, Collaboration. trust. Yes. Yes. And that's where we can come like with an open mind, you know, to pull in other people's ideas and, and that will add to ours, not trump ours, but add to ours. And maybe, you know, we've kind of got the half the idea and then somebody else fills in the other blank. That's just where those really cool, fabulous conversations start. So if we start a conversation with the question, Hey, Laura, it's great to talk to you today. Tell me what's going well. Yeah. Or for instance, if you're following back up on this quote experiment and you say, tell me what you like about it. Tell me what's working. Because yeah. even if it's, if it's been more or less, even a, a disaster, mm -hmm. typically there's at least something that's working about it. With. Right. And you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. If, if there let's, because that's what happens if we start with, all right, so how's this working? Well, this sucks and that sucks. And they, okay. Then we tend to just throw the whole thing out yeah. and start over when really there were things that were working well with it. Yeah. So let's start with what's working well and go from there. Okay. So, let's, um, I want to say one, and then if you have any more, uh, I might steal your last one. So, um, you can just tell me I'm right. If I'm stealing, <laughs> <laughs> I find that I'm, we move towards trust. If when someone's telling me something that's hard for them to say, instead of listening to respond, I listen to say back what they told me. And even just knowing that I listened is the most diffusing thing. Like I feel so much safer or she feels my employee feels so much safer because they know that I took the time to really hear what they were trying to say. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Instead of listening to re respond, listening to accept or reject is mostly what, what people listen for. Right. Sure. I want to, want to be uh, confirmed that I was right in what I was yes. saying, or yes. I want to, or I want to, um, find where I can get my argument back in there. So just listening to connect. So Laura, yes, I'm going to say yes. And if I may just add that, that kind of brings up another point that I think is really huge walking into any conversation. If, if we can remember, no matter how widespread we think we are on any point with anybody, there's probably at least 10%. If we can just concede that in 99% of conversations, there's at least 10% that that other person has within their con their piece of the conversation or with their idea, they're probably at least 10% right. So if we can listen, in, in your um, words, if we can listen to connect and to find that 10%, so this is my biggest one, listen with curiosity. Yeah. Like look for what you have in common and the 10% that's right, so then you can start a building block, you know, and, and work together towards, towards that conversation even, or a solution. If there's really a problem involved, starting with finding that, that part you have in common, that's another way to get that foundation of trust and to be able to relax into the conversation. And when that person really feels like you're trying to find that common ground, again, they're going to be able to relax into the idea that, that you're an ally that you're there with them, not, you know, power with, not power over. Mm -hmm. And it, let's, let's work on this together. Let's connect. That's a I huge one. That. Yeah. That's awesome. And I can tell that you've done a lot of hours of study on this subject and you've really dove into like the biology of it, the neurobiology. And so that as you give these, um, as you give instructions and help and counseling to people, it's kind of based in science. You know, it's a, yeah, 100% based in science. I'm actually uh, certified in conversational intelligence that um, it is all based on like, yes, on the neuroscience of conversations, the chemistry of the conversations. That's yeah. so cool to think about that there's chemistry in our conversations because it gives me confidence that I could learn the chemistry and be better at it. You know, that's yes. not just a mystery. There's, there are, yeah, that, and that there are actually black and white answers in something, you know, that is, that, like you say, is sort of mystical. There's all, you know, there's also the, the beautiful non-thinking part <laughs> that, that we're able to get to when we stop overthinking and we get out of that overthinking survival brain into sort of that non-thinking um, stage. So there's probably women who are listening to us right now who are like, oh my gosh, this is exactly what I needed to hear. And maybe they want to ask you a question. 
or um, they just want to know more about what you teach, what would you tell those women to do? They can find me at, my company is called Let's Talk Results. And, um, and I'm Robin with a Y. So, I mean, I would invite anybody, you can email me at robin at let's talk dash results.com or look up let's talk dash results um, dot com. You can connect with me, you know, through my website, you can book uh, some time to just chat with me, no charge at all. Um, you know, we can just have, we can just have a conversation about conversations, mm -hmm. see if there's any way um, that, that I can help. And um, I'm always happy to do that. Yeah. And I just want to make a note for my readers. I did a coffee chat with Robin and it was really helpful. <laughs> so if you're thinking you might want to, I encourage you to reach out to her because um, her advice was extremely um, helpful for me in my situation with my practice. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Laura. Well, I just want to thank you for taking the time to be on my podcast. And also I just want to um, encourage you because you're an entrepreneur now and you're doing your thing and going out on your own. I know that takes a lot of courage because I've done it myself and <laughs> I'm still doing it now. And I just want to congratulate you for doing that. And thanks again for being on. Thank you so much for having me, Laura, and for uh, supporting me and some fantastic conversations that we've had. I've really in, enjoyed getting to know you and, um, and being able to be on here. Hopefully some of this has been of some help for somebody. Oh, yes. If anyone's listened so far, it's helpful for sure. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Robin. Thanks, Laura. Thank you for listening to Love Your Practice with Dr. Laura Mock. I would love to meet you. To join our movement, find the Facebook group called Love Your Practice and request to join. If you can't find it, just send me a message and I'll add you. You'll find me there helping all of my ladies to fall in love with their businesses and have a better life.